Well, yesterday I started this talk. Uh, <laughs> I planned uh, at the, on giving the talk that I gave at CodeMesh uh, a couple of years ago, and I ended up writing a whole new talk uh, with grabbing some stuff from before. So here we go. Uh, J is a programming language I really enjoy, and this talk is about an aspect that it brought to me that took me a long time to figure out um, what it is that makes it so appealing to me. Um, and it's largely the syntax and the way that connects with its semantics. J is um, a programming language uh, designed primarily by Ken Iverson and implemented primarily by Roger Wee. Uh, it is uh, part of a long tradition in programming. There was a time when its predecessor was in the top half dozen programming languages in use, I suspect. Uh, I won't be able to show a lot of J today. There's cool stuff that won't be here. But one of the foremost things about it is that we work with expressions um, so much more than statements. The stuff I'm going to show you is really all about expressions in J and, and not at all about what I think of as statements. Um, the syntax is very light and we will be covering the bulk of it um, in, uh, in this. Um, when I say names have equal status, uh, there's a kind of um, um, priority or first, uh, uh, first classness about them in that the, uh, any major part of speech can be named and your name, what you've defined, can fit into the expression equal to uh, addition or subtraction or any of the other things that are built into the language. Um, this gives it a very even, uh, con um, consistent feel. It is an array programming languages, language. It has a single data structure, which is uh, re rectangular uh, arrays of n dimensions. And all the operations apply naturally across uh, the, the entirety of these collections, typically without specifying um, elements or loops. The tightness of the rules of syntax, as I've explored this, I've decided that it has a lot to do with things being meaningful when they are next to one another. Two tokens next to one another, uh, two numbers next to one another, these have meaning that is represented in that um, syntactic abutment. And so we see this with um, the bridge between the rules and, and the meaning. But first, I want to tease you with some other languages. Let's start with SQL. In this sort of situation, I see this a bunch. And as a J programmer, it, it kind of makes me wonder why they stopped there. I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, why this use of symbols, APL and J programmers love symbols, but it just seems odd that they didn't go all the way to English if they're going to do that. It does make sense, though, because what we're actually looking at here isn't uh, natural language processing, surprise, surprise, but a structure of um, demarcation, uh, which, within which we get expressions. So we have, um, in this case, it's a statement, but I've I've decided that it's not specific to statements. This is about whether or not things tie together immediately or far apart. And a statement structure like this breaks things up across the, um, uh, the world that it, 
it creates. And the expressions that go into those uh, slots are a lot like parameters um, to a function. Text is inherently linear, and I believe it's because language has its roots in audio, in talking, and in hearing. And so it's a lot like a tape recorder, and you get one dimension. The second dimension we use to some degree. Uh, we use it in the shape of our characters. We use it in making multiple lines in our code. But the meaning of things is largely a matter of how do we see it across a line. And insofar as we break it, things into multiple lines, it's still sort of a, a stream of things. Here's a Java statement with uh, the ternary operator. Just like with the SQL, um, we have structuring. Uh, the biggest structure, of course, with Java is the semicolons that breaks us into a series of statements. But with the, the ternary, what we've got here is a breaking into different expression zones with this, um, uh, these delimiting features. And these are the sort of things that I'm going pointing out that J doesn't have, uh, by and large. Now, parentheses are really useful. They're useful here just to say, oh yeah, and this stuff all goes together, even though syntactically there's no difference here. This has the same meaning with or without the parentheses. And parentheses are a great example of uh, setting up a context and having to work with everything that's in that context until the close of that. And there's a kind of mental model that goes on when you hit a parenthesis um, or uh, ternary operators, anything that gives you a structure across space. And here we have both things happening. We have the parentheses giving us a, a thing to think about until the end, and we also have the interior, which is a, a, what I call a dyadic uh, operation, where two things are compared by the comparator in the middle. Now, this is not only good Java, it's perfectly good um, J as well. The languages converge at this point. And the most exciting thing to me, the, the key point of this uh, talk, is that when we rely on adjacency, we get the meaning right there. And when we use delimiters, we're in suspense. We're holding on until we get the rest of it. And I think we need both of these. I don't think we can program with one or the other. Um, but I've found that uh, there's a kind of um, burden of ma managing and memorizing context that comes with lots and lots of structures uh, like a do end, right? I get a do, and now it's this additional context thing. I get a for, now I'm waiting for this. I get an if, you know, maybe an else. You know, I, these things stack. And all, all of those have to be kept in mind as I'm reading code in contrast with things like A is less than B, where that has an immediate resolution uh, with those things being uh, next to one another. The immediately there, I think, is actually not a, uh, uh, a metaphor. I think it's very literally true. There is nothing in between. Now let's look at, I don't know, Haskell or any other number of languages. Um, this is a way to write a list. And in J, that list is written like this. So this is a kind of use of adjacency. Um, it's supported at, a, at the parsing level in J so that this all counts as a single token, those numbers being uh, next to one another. 
and using white space rather than uh, special characters to, uh, uh, to get in between. It's not much less, uh, not much fewer characters than the other one, um, but it strikes me as less cluttered and it leaves these other characters available for other meanings in the language. Um, this reliance on um, adjacency for building um, numeric nouns is something where you'll be thinking of as I go through these uh, examples because you'll have to group the numbers and think of this as a single value before you think of that value being an argument to a verb. The special uh, terminology that Jay favors uh, is nouns, verbs, adverbs, conjunctions, and trains. Uh, sentences are the main thing that, uh, uh, the main unit of comp uh, action. Um, and this is roughly what, um, what those mean uh, from more standard discussion. So let's do some calculation with that, uh, that list. We can divide it by four. Division is done with this because uh, the slash is valuable for other purposes and historically has the different meaning from APL. And I'm dividing by four as a rational number so that I get rational result. Um, eight divided by four is two, as we see, and all those others are appropriate fractions. Um, there's nothing that specifies these uh, types other than the, the literal aspect of the, um, of the numbers, and that, that can be something of a, uh, a tricky thing, especially in comparison with what we're used to with uh, type systems. So that was a uh, dyadic or infix expression. And we also work with um, monadic or prefix expressions. Uh, here's a negation. We can negate uh, the um, 0 and 1 to get 0 and negative 1. We use a different mark for negation. Uh, as a verb and negative as a quality of a number. We can do a reciprocal of uh, a noun. So again, four, five, eight, the adjacency of those numbers means it counts as a single list, and that list is the noun that is the um, argument to reciprocal. Logical not on false, true, and 20% probability is, of course, true, false, and the complement of 20%, which is 80%. We can take that symbol for not, which, cutely enough, is designed to look sort of like the old not operator. Um, and we can give it a name. We can work with names uh, whenever we want and we have to when we create new named objects. If I define not to be that, then I can do the same thing. I get the same result. And I, I put parentheses in there to reflect the f of x that we're really familiar with, but it works just fine without the parentheses like we saw in the very first line here. These all have the same meaning. So the, the first thing I talked about is how this uses adjacency to denote a numeric list. The next thing I talked about is how we used adjacency to uh, apply functions to data or um, to calculate a value. So it's a lot like uh, 
just running a calculator. And I'm not showing the, the results of these, I'm just um, comparing, because there are, to my mind, three ways where adjacency is used to great effect in J, and they all come together at the same time. Um, creating nouns, uh, the specifically these uh, numeric ones, uh, creating nouns through calculation, like we see in those two lines. Um, and the patterns for that calculation, again, is a noun up, uh, as the argument to the right of a verb or nouns on both sides of a verb. Since it's linear, this is all the options we have, uh, except for, of course, uh, having the other direction of uh, argument for a single argument, and we use that for higher order functions. Now we're getting into the third thing. Instead of producing a value like negate four or subtract five from eight, which give us nouns, these give us verbs. These give us programs that, to work with. So the first of them, the plus slash, um, is, uh, The verb, the addition, uh, is the argument to the adverb, which is the slash. And this means summation. And it will sum across um, a rectangular structure of any sort. Um, and there's cool stuff there I don't have time for. <laughs> uh, the second line. Uh, is a conjunction. I use V, C, V to indicate the conjunction takes two arguments. Those arguments are verbs. It produces a new verb. And the at sign is the conjunction here. It is similar to the uh, circle of composition, function composition. There are perhaps a dozen function composition primitives in J. Uh, and we're going to look at the two most important ones next. Um, ah, yes, that's the, those are the higher order functions that I've got colored there, uh, the adverb and the conjunction. Um, examples of the last two uh, I'll get into in a few minutes. But these sections show three different ways that I see uh, adjacency used. Notice we don't have any parentheses. We don't have uh, brackets. Um, all the meaning here is resolved by considering what's next to uh, each component uh, using the appropriate uh, ordering. So let's move those uh, these four things up because these are all the the things that create programs. Uh, again, we've got the uh, verb as an argument to an adverb. That'll create, typically, a new program. It can actually create any form of speech. At this point, we've, we've got uh, uh, high power. Um, the second one, uh, I talked about the conjunctions. Now, the last two I haven't talked about. These are the um, verb trains, fork and hook. So fork is three verbs in a row, isolated, nothing else adjacent. And hook is two verbs in a row, nothing else adjacent. You'll notice that there are no parameters specified here. Those are implicit or tacit. Um, they're implied. And I didn't bring a um, diagram of what those, um, um, how the parameters work, which is a shame. Uh, it's worth looking up. <laughs> the, these, like all J verbs, are ambivalent. That is, they can work with either a single argument or two arguments. Um, 
They may not be defined, but in terms of the syntax, either one is uh, uh, interpreted by the parser. So in the case where uh, we're working with a fork, the argument to that train is first uh, presented, in effect, to the outer verbs. And the results of those verbs' calculations are the argument to the inner verb, which always receives two arguments, as is suggested by its position in between the other two verbs. Um, the hook is similar, uh, and I've got examples of both coming up. Here's the example that I came up with for a fork before. And um, the left verb here, it's worth noticing, is itself a compound thing. We've got a verb being applied to an adverb to create a new verb. So there are actually two things have, uh, involved in that leftmost verb. The same is true of the leftmost verb of this hook. Uh, that's the uh, reflect or passive which if a verb is given a single argument, the meaning of that is that it will copy that argument to the other side and treat it dyadically. If the verb is uh, used with two arguments, what that means is that it will swap the order of the arguments. And the left one will be the right one, and the right one will be the left. So you may be able to understand the left verb there, but the right verb, I would expect, could be um, a challenge. The right verb is the entire rest of the um, sequence. Um, and this idea of a sequence is why we call these verb trains. So that verb is itself a fork made of three verbs. Now. Admittedly, the two is not a verb. Um, there's some fanciness going on there. It's a matter of uh, convenience and a, and a fun story how we can get away with using two as a verb in that case. Um, there's an older style in which we can make it more explicit that the two is a verb. Um, the vertical bar here is um, residue, uh, better known as modulo. and uh, so we're going to be dividing by two and seeing what is left over. Um, and the uh, rightmost verb is itself compound. That is made of three things. That has the um, uh, composition um, uh, conjunction in the middle. And that, the hash mark there means tally, or count how many things there are. And the i dot means integers, which means give me so many integers starting from zero, ascending. So if we pass this a list, and any noun is a list of some sort, um, we count how many are items there are in the top level. And that number is then passed to the integers, which produces a list of integers uh, up to n minus 1, because we're starting from 0. Uh, all of those integers are then divided by 2, and we either have a 1 or a 0, depending on whether or not there's a a value left over. Um, and the uh, hash mark uh, at the far left, because it's used with two arguments, is copying. It's like, how many copies do we make of this thing? And a list of ones and zeros will mean we either take it or don't take it. So this is a filter. 
And filter in J is derived from copy. It's not a fundamental thing, which uh, I find very pretty. I've done the naming thing again to show that this whole thing counts as a single program. And we can use that uh, in either, either form. Uh, I put into words how I, uh, you know, could say it through. The second of these are the vocabulary, the official vocabulary names. If you look up in the J documentation, those are the names that are associated with those particular things, except for two, right? Um, but the other one is sort of the way my mind works with it, insofar as I draw it to English. I don't need to draw it to English because once I'm reading J, it actually means that when I look at the characters. So if we give it a string, it will take uh, all the characters from the odd numbered locations uh, in that string. And we didn't specify any loops uh, whatsoever. And uh, everything was figured out just from what was next door to it. More information is available from jsoftware.com. That's sort of the center of the J world. And I have a little time for questions. I do. Um, I've programmed in Ruby and Java, a um, fair amount, and JavaScript and Python some. Um, and I'm enough of a language nerd to read blog posts, at least on lots of other stuff like Haskell and, and the like. Well, it can take a while to learn. It took me quite a while. Um, I know some people picked it up uh, much faster than I did. And I sus I'm not sure in what ways it's harder to learn. I think there's um, a tendency to take the bias of expectations from other programming experiences and carry that into it. Um, I was exposed to APL in high school and did programming in not languages entirely unlike that, you know, basic and Fortran and um, Pascal sort of stuff um, for several decades until I came back to this, partly because I remembered how interesting APL was. Um, I find a lot of the other languages frustrating and difficult to read having learned J. And a lot of the reason for that is J has taught me to read such that I have a full mental model of exactly what's happening. And it took me a while as I, I got into J heavily before I got into Ruby and Java and things like that. And in a professional environment, I was really frustrated. I was like, these people are reading so fast. How can they do this? Finally, it dawned on me, they can't. They are not reading the code, all right? If there's a bug in there, or if it has a meaning other than what they've assumed, they don't see it because they're not actually comprehending each aspect that they're reading. They're scanning, they're skimming, they're seeing a pattern, and if unless it contradicts their expectations, they figure it's close enough. Whereas Jay brought me into the idea that reading code means having that code so directly in mind that I understand the relationships. So that's harder, <laughs> but it's different. <laughs> Um, 
I have actually had difficulty being happy with the other languages. That's been the big problem. Um, I, I kick and scream more than I <laughs> like to admit. Um, and a lot of it is because there are certain things that seem like they would be just so much more straightforward that there's all sorts of gyrations that other languages expect me to do that this doesn't. And things that seem like trivia or things that seem like uh, exceptions um, and the tidiness, uh, the smallness of J is, is remarkable. The, the number of methods in Ruby's array class is about the same as the number of primitives in J, right? <clears throat> Which makes sense, roughly speaking. It's an array language, it's an array class, but I can do so much <laughs> with the array language, I can't do that much with the array class. And it's not a fair comparison, but um, it's been a, a point where I've kicked and screamed, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm out of time, thank you.